So I did the Tonight Show, and uh, Johnny, he kind of liked me. I could come over and, and talk to him. And uh, one night in particular, he says, you know, BJ, I looked at your schedule. I mean, you're doing, you know, like 245 shows this year. And he says, how do you do that? I, and I said, well, I take a lot of pills. <laughs> oh, and, gosh. you know, it really threw him off. And he, and he got shook up. And, of course, it shook me up. And so I stopped doing TV. And I really didn't do any of those shows again until I got sober. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. BJ Thomas is on the show. BJ has sold over 70 million records with hits like Hooked on a Feeling, which peaked at number five on the Billboard charts. BJ's first number one hit was the song Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head from the film Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Raindrops keep falling on my head, but that doesn't mean my eyes will soon be turning red. The cry is not for me, cause I'm His second number one hit, Hey, Won't You Play Another Somebody Done Somebody Wrong song. I first heard when I was probably seven years old when my dad was singing along to it in the car. Hey, won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel... This happens to be my personal favorite, and I still spontaneously break into this song around my own family. Over the last 50 years, BJ has had a total of eight number one hits and 26 top 10 singles. His song Raindrops won an Oscar in 1970 for the Butch Cassidy movie. And BJ even performed that song at the Oscar ceremony, which he talks about during the interview. BJ was a frequent guest on the talk show circuit as well, with multiple appearances on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson and The Ed Sullivan Show. He was also somehow able to cross over into not just country, but into gospel music as well becoming the first gospel artist to go multi-platinum. In 1981, BJ became the 60th member of the Grand Ole Opry. He also won five Grammys and in 2014 was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. BJ is ranked by Billboard in the top 50 most played artists over the last 50 years. And even though BJ has been doing this for decades, he is still performing and has performances booked through the end of 2021. Although it was great to talk to BJ about his awards and accolades, what made this interview cool was the connection we made. We both spent time in Houston when we were young, and our fathers both struggled with addiction issues. So it was impactful for me to talk to BJ on this level. He turned out to be an incredibly sweet, humble, and creatively insightful guest. So without further ado, let's jump right into my chat with Grammy-winning multi-platinum recording artist BJ Thomas. Mr. Thomas, thank you so much for making time for me. I know you're you're busy and uh, you have uh, a lot of things going on, and and you made time for me. So thank you. Yeah. Hey, well, thanks for talking to me, man. Just just call me BJ. BJ, it is okay. That's great. Well, uh, you and I have uh, some something in common. I spent some of my childhood in Houston, Texas. I actually went to high school in Houston. Oh, you did. Yeah. Where'd you go? Aleph Hastings. You Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. I went to Reagan in Houston, but uh, yeah, Houston was a great place, great city for music. Uh, yeah, I always remember going to Ray Charles with there twice a year. And of course, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, very familiar with Bobby Bland and uh, I used to go see him all the time. They always had a number of R&B acts coming through town and then they had you know of course dick clark and all that so it was a great it was a great music city you know that i was going to ask you about that why do you think music was a hub back then for for music you know, I, I don't know i uh, you know we had peacock records there uh don roby and peacock records and uh um you know that was a huge uh, r&b label 
And, uh, you know, they just had a bunch of great people. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It was, a, it, it was quite different back then, it seems like to me. I mean, I haven't lived there since 67, but now, now I go down there now, but only if I'm getting paid. You know? <laughs> I'll, go, <laughs> I'll, go work, I'll go work somewhere. But, uh, right. you know, I, I don't know why that is, but, uh, you know, uh, I've seen some fantastic shows there. Sam Cook, and, of course, I saw Jackie Wilson at least once a year there. So I don't exactly know why, but I know there, there's a lot of music, um, you know, coming out of that part of Texas and then, and then out in West Texas. And I, I guess it's just always been that way. I'm not, even with, you know, they, they had ZZ Top and, uh, you know, they just had some great, great people from down there. Uh, ZZ Top. Yeah. They were just down the road for me when I was yeah, in yeah. Houston. Um, so. Why do you think you went the direction you did musically when you you were sort of in the the heart of the South or at least part of the heart of the South, and it seems like you went more pop and contemporary before you kind of dived into country music? Yeah, yeah, I really didn't just uh, seriously uh, devote my energy to country until the eighties, but uh, you know, it, I, I I was a product of top forty radio and. Uh, all the music was on one one station, you know, the country pop, uh, gospel, whatever. And, uh, you know, I kind of grew up with, with Southern gospel music. And I used to love to go to church, uh, not so much for the church, but I'd love to go for the music. And, uh, and I just grew up, grew up with that. I never really, uh, you know, I guess they look at Lonesome now. My first hit kind of as a country song now, but for that time, it was uh, considered more an R&B. R&B record, and my first gig out of Houston was with James Brown, and I worked with uh, Percy Sledge, Jackie Wilson, and just uh, all the great black acts for two or three years, four years, uh, uh, you know, until I, you know, eventually hooked up with Dick Clark and that kind of thing. So I was always, the my biggest, my favorite music was R&B music, um, and I'm not sure I ever really recorded any, you know, authentic uh, R&B music, but I always uh, tried to identify personally with the music I was doing. And, uh, and uh, I tried to, you know, I tried to have soul about it and, and, uh, and make it sound, sound believable. So I kind of had to believe what I was doing. And, uh, you know, just at the time, um, you know, that I, that I started doing the country music country, it just had this huge explosion with the urban cowboy and, and uh, Kenny and uh, just, uh, you know, uh, all the great country music that was going and pop was kind of on the, on the decline. And, uh, you know, I'm really now, I'm not really sure we really have pop music now. It's more or less, it's more or less, um, you know, country, country and R and B and hip hop. That's kind of the, uh, the, the big thing now, but um you know, it was a it was kind of a career choice because I had kind of just spent a few years in gospel music, and that had, uh, you know, I had recorded a uh, a song, and, and we sent out uh, sent it out to the stations, and you know, they began to say to them, "Well, we don't play gospel music," and we said, "Well, that's not a gospel song. If you listen to it, it's a regular, it's a country country song." So it was hard once once we had the gospel kind of label. It, it was really hard to go back to where where I was, and I'm not sure I ever succeeded in in getting back to to just you know singing to to everyone. I don't think I'm so much concerned. And I think gospel people consider me gospel, and country people consider me country and pop pop. But I've I've been lucky in that in that sense. But we kind of just consciously uh, went country when we left. Not, not that we totally left gospel, but we, when we decided to go back just to making uh, real music, uh, regular music that I that I'd always done. And country was so huge that that's the direction we went. Yeah, it's interesting the the different different musical worlds that you straddled throughout your career. Um, I I don't think that you could fairly say B.J. Thomas is is uh, contemporary or country or R and B or easy listening. I mean, you really had this knack for just having your own unique voice that 
really appealed to, I mean, you sold 70 million records. So obviously you appealed to a lot of people. Yeah, then that, 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 and that's great. I've always just felt uh, very fortunate and, and lucky because of that. I, you know, as as I said, I think I, I think it was just a product. Of the reason, you know, I just being out of the top forty era, I just tried to do the songs that I really identify could identify with personally, and songs I really believed in, and, and uh, kind of growing up in that area. Well, then. You know, there was there were all the genres on the same station, and that, I think that's uh, why I did it. I think one of the really great things in my career was that I worked with some of the great writers and composers of my time, uh, with the you know uh, Backrack and David and uh, uh, Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil and Mark James and uh, Stephen Dorff and a lot of people who were uh, really you know and they're all in the Hall of Fame now, songwriters, and uh, uh, that, I think that was. That was really a fortunate thing that I got to work with some great writers, kind of starting in Memphis. And uh, they had to, they had a great team of songwriters, Dan, Dan Penn and Mark James and those guys. And, you know, just lucky, you know. It's, it's an interesting dynamic that I don't think really exists today like it did in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, but there's this dynamic of this singer-songwriter where you have songwriters that are very prolific but they're only known to the musical world. Like they're, they're sort of uh, behind the scenes people almost by definition, but they yeah. write, they write songs for particular performers like yourself, like Mr. Uh, Mr. Butler wrote uh, somebody done somebody wrong song and, and yeah. thought of thought of you or his partner with, uh, uh, Chip, yeah, I wrote that with Chip's moment and Chip's, Chip's moment was happened to be my producer at that time. So, uh, but I think they pl- had planned on uh, doing it on someone else. Um, and they never played. I would cut an album uh, with the Chips, and um, uh, he never played it for me until at the end of the album. We listened to the album, and we didn't think we had a hit record on there. And uh, um, uh, so, the one of the one of the musicians, Bobby Emmons, uh, out of the um, Memphis Boys, the American Studio Group, said, "Hey, Chips, play BJ that that song you just wrote with Larry." And then he kind of he kind of got all embarrassed, but then he did play it. But I think he was planning on doing it on someone else but it was a natural natural fit for me and then that's how we used to work it i used to go uh you know memphis was very busy and they were recording everybody but uh, and i hung out with the songwriters anyway they were all my best friends the, the guys uh, connected with american studio and we would talk about uh, you know hey i'm going in the studio we talk about what kind of songs we wanted and they would uh, you know pitch ideas at me how about this kind of thing and uh, yeah and so they would. They would write songs, especially for me, and, and I think that really uh, that really worked. You know? So you, you started. You had a high school band in Houston, right? Yeah, I had a band called the Triumphs. It, w- it wasn't my band. It was our. It was our band. We started the band. When we were all fifteen years old. We wanted to just uh, basically. I don't know if you, uh, you remember Roy Head and the Trades. Roy Head had Treat Her Right. I want to tell you a story. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know if you remember that, but we wanted to have a band like Roy. And, uh, you know, so we uh, we got our got our band together when we were really young. And we we just, uh, we had a big horn section eventually after about a year. And so we, we basically just played rhythm and blues and rock and roll, rock and roll music. And it was a great way to kind of get started. Cause, I mean, the first time we played together, we, we convinced them not to, put lights on us. I mean, we were so <laughs> scared and embarrassed until so they didn't turn the lights on. We kind of played in the dark. And as, uh, from, from there, it was kind of a slow progression. To, but uh, it, was, it was great to be in a band because I think that's where you learn how to, how to do your thing, how to be a part of a band, what your, what your role is. And, uh, and I, I learned a lot like that. And I still talk to those guys all the time. I talked to two of the Triumphs uh, this week. So, um, Oh, that's awesome. We're still, yeah, we're still buddies. And I talk to Roy once a week, twice a week now during the quarantine. So he's still my best friend. So when did you find your voice? When did you know that you had a voice that was suitable for performing and uh, singing in a band? Well, you know, I was always young. I guess I was 10, 11, 12, something like that. And and, uh, I would... I, I used to really like to go to church. I like to go to church. I like to hang out with the kids and I loved the way the music felt. 
and I would like to play on the baseball team and all that and all that stuff. Uh, but I know I did notice early on. I'm not, I don't want this to sound like I'm uh, uh, bragging on myself, but I noticed that you know I never could quite stick with the with the program on the on the guy on the hymns. I was always uh, I was always doing some kind of thing with the with the melody. Riffing. And uh, and I and I and I recognize what what are you doing and why can't why don't you stick with the melody? So I always had a sense of uh, um, and they tell me that I, I I was always singing since I was just a little guy. So uh, I don't know. I just I guess it was like just uh, uh, born. I was born with it, but you know I never uh, I never thought it through like man you know you. you I never thought it through like I wanted to get up in front of a, bu- a bunch of people and sing. And that's the last thing I, I, I ever thought of. And I don't know if it was just a subconscious thing uh, that I was afraid of it or what. But, uh, you know, I wanna, after I got in that band and we started playing for dances, started getting popular and a lot of kids would come to see us. Uh, I, I often thought, well, man, what are you getting yourself into here? Because, you know, you're scared. <laughs> you're scared to death. You don't even want to do th- really do this. But I had such a burning desire, and and I and I loved to sing until I had to, you know, I had to at some point learn how to get up in front of people without without being too scared. You know, how long did that I'm still take? Still working on that one. Oh, you're still working on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I would imagine that your parents had to be pretty supportive if you're playing in a band at 15 and playing dances, supportive of your dream. Well, you know, not really. Uh, my dad was a working man. He would have rather that I had a job, uh, you know, that I had a real job. So they didn't, they were kind of, uh, I'd say, hey, I'm singing, I'm singing with a band. And they were kind of, you know, they wouldn't say too much, but I could tell they, they weren't really thrilled about it. Now, when I had my first hit record and I started getting the airplay and my dad really, he loved that. And he was, uh, you know, and he was always constantly calling the, the radio station get them to play my stuff. And they, they got to where they could recognize his voice without him even introducing himself. <laughs> and uh, so he loved it uh, after it got rolling, but it, they weren't that thrilled um, at the beginning. You know? <laughs> so what was your first big break as a musician and a performer? Well, it was, my, uh, you know, we got the chance to make our first album and we'd had some local you know, it was kind of back in the day when the stations would play your record, even if it wasn't very good. They'd, <laughs> you know, they, they'd, they'd play it for a couple of weeks, or maybe they'd play it for a week, and uh, and uh, they would do that for local talent. And and uh, and, uh, and so I, I, of course, I became very good friends with all the disc jockeys, and uh, and we were all friends and everything. And they were pulling for me, and uh, we got the chance to make our first album, and uh, we cut the the album one night. And uh, so it was about 5.30 in the morning uh, when I re- remembered I needed to cut up kind of a, my dad had asked me to make a country thing for him. And so I cut I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry, the old Hank Williams thing. And, uh, you know, in three weeks, we put it out. It was on the B side of what we thought was a hit, but it found its way on the radio. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it went number one in three weeks. And uh, and I started getting uh, you know, gigs out of out of uh, out of town and and uh, out of state and and things, and uh, it just kind of kind of grew grew from that. And and when did you become your own act? Basically, I mean, you had a band and you recorded this hit song that went that skyrocketed on the charts. Um, but w- when did you become B.J. Thomas the the band? I mean, you were the guy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, ha- I kind of went BJ uh, because of Billy Joe Royal, who became my best friend, uh, had a, had down in the boon- boondocks right before I had Lonesome. And once he when he had that hit, where well, we were trying to figure out what my name was going to be, everybody called me BJ, but my name was Billy Joe, and so and all that. But so anyway, I've kind of always been Billy Joe uh, professionally, and uh, you know. Uh, I was with the with the tribes. I lo- I loved them. We had some great times. But when I had that, my, I had a gig, I had an offer from Dick Clark, and I'd already gone out. My first gig out of Houston was with James Brown. I went out and, and sang with James Brown. I had to put another band together. Uh, and uh, when I got this offer from uh, Dick Clark, I told the guys, "Hey, I got I just we just got an offer from Dick Clark," and they and 
And I said, but, but we have to back up all the acts. That was the main, main reason that they offered me the gig was because I, I had a band. And uh, we had to back all the other acts. And it was about 13 or 14 acts on that Dick Clark, on that Dick Clark thing. And uh, so he said, no, we don't want to back up the other acts. And I said, well, you know, hey, man, I mean, you know, we, ha- we have to. That's, what, that's why we're going on the thing. And they said, well, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to go then. Wow. And uh, so, I, so I said, uh, well, uh, and, you know, some of the guys were going to college and they were working for their fathers and stuff. So it really wasn't like we were breaking up, but they, they just didn't want to go do that. And I was going to be gone. Uh, I w- we were going to do like a hundred shows in, in, a, in a six weeks. So uh, they said, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. And so I said, well, you know, I'm going, I'm going to go. And I said, uh, I'm going to put another band together and I'm going to go. And they said, okay, go ahead, you know, go ahead. So I don't think we have, we ever re- realized we were going to be breaking up forever or I was going to be gone forever. But that's when I went out, I took my, I took, put another band together and I went out and then that's just what I did. The gigs uh, kept coming and, uh, you know, I kept, I kept traveling and we never, I never really went back to, you know, our circuit with the, with the triumph, our circuit was kind of the boondocks in Texas. We played the big dance halls on the weekend because uh, we were kind of young when we, we, we started. And you know we just never we never got back together. Now I've I played one or two gigs a year w- uh, with the Triumphs over the last ten years. We do like a uh, maybe a benefit, you know, down in the country or, or whatever. But uh, ever since then, it was just kind of my own my own deal. So that that seems like a real turning point in your career, where you made kind of a gutsy decision to go out and uh, back up, you know, perform a band, back up these other. Uh, acts and yeah. you know your your fellow bandmates decided to do take the safe road and nothing against that because everybody has no. you know a, a certain path they need to be on and uh but but that seems like a real turning point for you doesn't it yeah absolutely uh, you know i had to kind of uh uh you know i couldn't just hide out and uh you know by the horn section i couldn't you know kind of go stand by the drums and let them play something i mean i had to I had to be the front guy, and uh, you know it was a, it was uh, very challenging because I, um, you know I'm talking now you can't shut me up but but uh, <laughs> but back but back then I mean I wouldn't you know I wouldn't say anything I mean I I was a very quiet uh, um, in, you know guy and uh, so I had to learn how to uh, get up and uh, it, it took some courage but you know I never it never was like a do or die situation or a crossroads or anything it's just once I once I was with Dick Clark and we did that tour and it just uh, it just kept going and and, uh, and you know I never really went back to the to the uh, to the original original situation I, I think there was a time or two when I, I definitely wished wish that I could you know re-up re up with those guys uh because it, you know we were all best friends and there was like seven or eight of those guys uh but you know it just it just never happened so i had to kind of it took a it took a number of years to, to realize what the point was what, what what was the point of having of me entertaining i mean you know was it just for me to have a good time uh uh was it just money or, or whatever but uh you know, as the years went by, I realized, hey, what, what I, I'm really lucky to do something where people are showing up because they want to have a good time. And uh, it's up to you to make sure that you do your best and everybody has the best time they can have. So, you know, once I kind of got a handle on that, it became a little easier. So it, it sounds like stage fright or shyness is something that can be overcome and just uh, you can teach yourself to, to move through it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because I mean, I would be, I would be so scared. I mean, uh, it, it, it was amazing. Even up through the uh, Academy Award show when I, you know, when I performed on that, I, mean, I was as scared as a human being could be, but you know, I knew, I, I knew that if I just did what I, what I was supposed to do, and just do what I can do, which is sing the song, and just keep you know keep a hold of myself that that it would be okay. So that's how I I got I got through it. But now there were times when uh, 
I would do a show and I wouldn't pull it off. You know, I would be, uh, you know, back in those days, sometimes uh, I would uh, have to, uh, you know, be under the influence to, to get to get through some things. I get, I get tired and or I'd be, I'd be afraid or, or just, just whatever. So I had to work through all, all of that and realize, uh, uh, you know, that it wasn't a party and I couldn't, I couldn't just run and hide from it. And so there, there is a way, as you say, there is a way to defeat the stage fright. I think Barbara Streisand is the, maybe the most famous example of somebody who really has a, a bad case, Carly Simon. And so there are people who have gotten through it, by, and you just kind of get through it by just doing what you're supposed to do. You just, I just do what I, what I'm, uh, what I'm there for. I'll be, I'll be okay. <laughs> did, you, did you find after you became clean and sober in in the '70s that you had to relearn how to perform sober? Was that a a, a real change for you? Well, you know, that was the time when it. No, I, I didn't have to do that. Uh, that was the time when you know what it. it I wasn't afraid anymore. I wasn't scared. Um, it became it became kind of easy. Um, you know, I was healthy. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of times uh, in my early years, uh, you know, when you're using that motivation to to get your thing done, you're only good for just a, a, a certain amount of time. You know, you might not be on top of it for an hour and a half, you know. Right. So once I got sober, uh, you know, I was I was kind of comfortable and and it was easy and and uh, it, it, I, I kind of realized. Well, I remember my wife t- telling me one time. Uh, she said, uh, "Boy, you look like you don't look like you're having a very good time up there, you know." So I purposed to look like I was having a good time, and you know, in doing that, I did I did have a good time. But it became much easier for me to do once I was. Once I was sober and more healthy, and you know, and I, and I had a better relationship with uh, Gloria, and uh, you know, we had some more kids, and you know, at one point, actually, we kind of quit. Uh, I kind of, uh, I just told Gloria, man, I couldn't. I was kind of trying, you know, to talk about hit and bottom and stuff, and and I said, you know what, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't do it anymore, and um, so you know, man, we just um, decided to. Um, I was going to back off, so I backed off, and I did. The, I'd get down to doing like fifteen, twenty shows a year, and then we adopted this little girl, and and then Gloria got pregnant, and we had another kid, and it, it, then it turned into what I always, what you kind of always want. If you're married, if you're married, you want to have a family, and you want to have a good, solid marriage, and uh, so it kind of turned into into that, and uh, and then I kind of. Picked up working again, and uh, and that's so I've worked pretty steady for you know thirty thirty years or so since 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 seventy six yeah. was when we got we back we backed off for a few years, and uh, and you know we we kind of got it together again, and uh, but I I don't work nearly as much as I used to. I, mean, I used to go out and be gone for three three hundred days back in the you know back when I was, when I was younger and everything, but you know now I do. Somewhere between fifty seventy shows a year, and uh, and that and that works that works for me. Of course, no one's working now. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Shut we're down all, completely. We're all, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've noticed that your tour dates. I went on your website, and you st- you you have rebooked your your shows all the way through October of twenty twenty one, and um, but yeah. it's not but it's not a three hundred uh, day per, per year or 300 show per year schedule, which is yeah. probably more conducive. I just go out maybe know. for a few days at a time. I mean, I'm, I may, at the longest stretch, I may go out five or six days or something like that, but I just don't, uh, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm still like a one nighter kind of guy. I don't, I don't, uh, it's not my, uh, it, I'm not comfortable just working one place for, two, three weeks or what have you. So I like to do the one nighter. So we we'll just go out and do a few days at a time. And that, that works good for me. When I'd, I'd like to ask you about your experience at the Oscars in 69 with the uh, Butch Cassidy movie, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kid. So how far into your career were you when that happened and how, how I guess foreign or uh, unfamiliar and overwhelming was that okay. for you to experience? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it was all of those things, and, and and I don't want to forget to 
mention my buddy, uh, my, my lifelong friend is like my brother, a guy named Steve Tyrell, who's a singer now, but he used to be uh, kind of behind the scenes. And he was very instrumental in, in getting me signed on my first hit record. And, and he was very instrumental in getting me on that Oscar show because they were going to use, uh, I think, the Fifth Dimension to sing Raindrops on the on the Academy Award show. And then he, he uh, Steve knew a guy that with the Academy and he made sure that, you know, that I got that shot. And that was great. But yeah, it was like uh, that song changed changed everything it, it, it you know i kind of went up and cla- you know <clears throat> almost immediately i had to work to copacabana in new york you know uh-huh. <laughs> and that was like oh my god you know, what Legendary. am i doing and it was only it was only like four years i mean I, I had my first hit really in 66 so here i was you know three or four years later uh, man you know nominated for an academy award i'm gonna do the academy award show and and uh you know uh, steve and i both were were scared to death, you know. But uh, the one th- is, the one good thing about the Oscars is they they are, are rather uh, thorough <clears throat> about rehearsal, and you knowing what you knowing what the, uh, you're going to do, and that's pretty clear to you. So I, that was another case of, you know, if I go, I just got to go out here and do this song. And they they changed raindrops; they made it like a 12, 13 minute uh, thing, and it had bicycles and people riding around <laughs> and stuff. And um, so I just had to, you know, I had to concentrate on the music and uh, kind of focus and and uh, do my thing, even though I was pretty frightened. But I had <clears throat> Glenn Campbell and I were in the dressing room together and he was performing with the True Grit. And but, uh, you know, I had a real good feeling about that. Um, but it was uh, it was very challenging because all the movie stars were there and all the people that, you, oh, my God, you know, these these people that have always been like gods to you, you know. And uh, so it was. Uh, it was uh, one of the most, of course, the most exciting thing I think uh, I've ever I've ever done. And it came off. I I missed a couple of words. I had to I had to come down to the front of the stage and sit on the, the front steps, and uh, and then of course get up pretty quick, sing a sing a line or two, and then get up and keep moving around. And I and I kind of looked at this certain actress, and I forgot I forgot. The words and I kind of had to go. Mm, one <laughs> thing I know, and and uh, and I I was so disappointed, and I thought, of course, I I could tell you know people s- saw me make that mistake from Mars, you know, uh-huh. and it, it was a, it was the <laughs> end of the world, and so I never would even let anybody even compliment me on the show or anything. But over the over the years, I became very good friends with the, uh, Greg Yantek, uh, who is. Uh, in the music business with ABC, and he got me a, a CD of the performance, and the, it, it looked like it came off okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. So I always thought I'd really mess it up, but you know, uh, I did. I did pull it off quite well because it just I just did what I was supposed to do, and and uh, it came off good. Of course, that Bert won a couple of Oscars, and Hal David won one, and it was just. Uh, an unreal, unreal night. Uh, great time in my life. You know, I was working with uh, Mr. Bacharach, who was this awesome, you know, handsome, charming guy. And and, and uh, when I went out to his house to rehearse before we did the bicycle scene, you know, Angie Dickinson answered the door. And, you know, he was married to Angie at that time. And so it was like a whole new world for me. And it happened, you know, as as you said, it happened pretty quick, you know. So after the Oscars, you really hit the the talk show circuit and you were a pretty frequent guest on, um, I know Johnny Carson a few times and Ed Sullivan and, um, you, you became a pretty regular, uh, fixture on the talk show circuit. Did you, was that natural for you? Did it feel natural or did, were you still kind of struggling with, um, stage fright and maybe some insecurity? Yeah, I was st- I was still uh, dealing with that, and of course during that time I, I was a, a drug addict, and, uh, and uh, you know so I I had to I had to deal with it. I, you know I had certain rules, personal rules that I kept that I, that I would not record or perform, you know TV uh, if I if I wouldn't get lit up to do that. So I had a certain amount of control over it, but uh, it was it was a you know I think the whole thing about show business and and being famous and and all that stuff. I think it's all 
really unnatural, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, this you know being being famous is such a such a weird a weird thing, but it, it's, it goes good if, for you to sell records and make money and, and things. But it kind of goes against uh, your natural. At least it did me. It went against my natural nature. And I, you know, I've I've learned to uh, like to do it. I mean, I like to do it, the interviews that, that we're doing, and uh, and I like I love to perform and I love to record and that that whole thing. But the, during that period of time, it didn't come that natural natural to me. You know, of course, I did the Tonight Show, and uh, Johnny kind of he kind of liked me, and he would have me on there, and he I could come over and, and talk to him, and. Uh, one one night in particular, he says, you know, BJ, you're working. I looked at your schedule. I mean, you're doing, you know, like 245 shows this year. I mean, he says, how do you do that? You know, and, I, and, I, and I, of course, I wouldn't. I, and I said, well, I take a lot of pills. <laughs> okay. And, you know, it really threw it really threw him threw him off. And he went, oh, oh, and he and he got shook up. And, of course, it shook me up and it embarrassed my 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 wife and embar- embarrassed everybody. And so then there was a, at a certain point I stopped doing, I stopped doing TV and I really didn't do uh, any of those shows again until, until I, I got sober and that, you know, then I could, I can handle it and I could, you know, not be unprofessional. But the, the, the uh, Ed Sullivan show was an easy thing to do. He was a great guy and uh, you know, he was easy to talk to and he was real, really friendly and he, he made me feel like he really liked me, and uh, you know he he loved my wife Gloria. He loved her, and uh, and uh, so that that was always an easy one to do. Yeah, I, I think in uh, in 1970 to be that brutally honest on camera uh, is probably a shocker. It was for way a host. ahead of its time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right now everybody's talking about that kind of stuff and they expect that type of brutal honesty, but back then not so much. Yeah. yeah. You know, I had a lot of my uh, songwriter friends and uh, people call me and say, BJ, we understand, I understand how you, how you felt, man. I understand what you were saying, but very few people did. And it was like, Oh man, you know, cause, um, there's kind of a rule in in, in the in the music business and my, probably every business. You know, you, you can't drop the if you're doing something. If you're a lawyer and you're presenting a case, you can't all of a sudden kind of veer off and get personal about a problem you're having. You know, so <laughs> it, you true. know it was like you know it was it was kind of a, a real breach of uh, uh, of uh, approach and never do that. And, uh, and you know, so it was, I kind of you know. I took took responsibility for it, but it did make me back off for a number of years because, mm-hmm. you know, until I got sober, I really couldn't trust myself. I and mean, what am I going to say? Am I, you know, so uh, you know how that. I don't know if you. Hopefully, you've never had problems with that, but it's uh, it's uh, a lot to deal with when you are also like busy and and responsible for a band and and a record label and certain things. So uh, it was. Yeah something to get through it's definitely something i have experience with in my family uh my dad was um uh, addicted to uh pain medication and was an alcoholic and uh, yeah. he was he was a tour pilot though for for a lot of bands uh, throughout the 70s and 80s uh-huh. uh, um yeah. he, he flew bob hope and um uh, neil young and hart and uh, Joni mitchell but i think that that wow, yeah. that Great. lifestyle in fact you probably cross paths with them, I would imagine in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, well, I had the same experience. My, my dad was uh, my, my biggest hero, but uh, he was uh, an alcoholic and, uh, you know, he could be, he could be abusive and it was hard to get, uh, get next to him. And, uh, you know, so when you have that, uh, you know, when you grow up with that, you, you are going to have certain things uh, connected to that, that you're going to have to deal with and get, and get through. And, uh, you know, it looks like we both we both made it. So I'm, yeah. that's good. <laughs> well, it's definitely. I mean, having family members struggle with addiction is is a, a formative experience for everyone around them, and it and it can yeah. create you know our own problems and and challenges with uh, with substance abuse. But yeah. yeah, I think that lifestyle though. I mean, being on the road. My dad was on the road probably more than 300 days a year. Yeah. Um, you know, living out of hotels and hotel bars yeah. and all of that stuff. 
Uh, but yeah, I'm glad you came through it in the in the 70s as early as you did. Um, do you have yeah. time? Do you have time for a few more questions? I didn't want to. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we got out. I'm. I don't. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Okay. Yeah, just... I always was in the. As we talked about the triumphs, I was always in the triumphs. I, there was eight of us, and it was always. Hey, you know, it, it was always great. Then all of a sudden, I was on the road by myself. I mean, I had another band that I didn't even. I didn't really know them that well. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're by yourself and then, uh, you know, you, you've got to have a certain amount of character to, to deal with these things. And that I was still finding my care, my character. So it was a tough experience, but, uh, uh, I think it's uh, counted for the good in the, in the long run. Uh, you know, of course my kids are grown now and, 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 and all that, but, uh, it's, the best thing about it is that I survived it. I came close a number of times uh, of not making it, but uh, I think you know my wife Gloria, and we you know we got fifty two years now. So, and you know having her and and she could always kind of see me for who I was and not who I thought I was, and so it it, it all worked out really well. You know, I, I've noticed, I, I've watched you um, in, in a lot of different performances over the last, you know, 10, 20 years. And I've heard you talk about people like Tony Bennett, who are uh, examples of how to live a life that, basically a life of, of longevity. And yeah. how do you do it? What are your secrets or what, what are the things that you do to make sure that you give your body and your mind and your spirit um, an opportunity to be in this as long as possible. Yeah, well, that's, that's uh, you have to figure out your own routine, but uh, you know that's uh, that's probably the greatest thing now is the is the longevity of the thing and the, and the, and the you know the uh, the being you know one of the fifty uh, top play uh, top airplay guys for the last fifty years, and so there's certain things you can only accomplish you know, over a period of time. And then that's the thing that really is very valuable uh, uh, to me now. But, you know, I've got to, um, you know, I don't, I quit drinking and, uh, and, and sobered up because I, I basically had to, if I, if, if I was going to continue, continue singing. And because I was one of those guys from my generation, we all smoked and, uh, you know, I had to quit smoking because uh, if I smoked it, a cigarette it would blow my blow my throat out and then i smoked other things too and and you know that eventually got to me where if i if i smoked some herb or whatever it messed up my my breathing and my and my so all most of the good things that i've done over a period of time <clears throat> of course now i'm getting but uh, uh over a period of time has been to so i could continue to uh, sing yeah uh but there uh, i have to have a routine i'm you know most of the time I will go in the night before a performance. Uh, the first the first day, I go in the night before. I get a good night's sleep. Um, I, I try to eat well, um, uh, and uh, I I don't I can't I can't run around all the time and be partying and everything. I have to stick. It's almost like I'm in training. I kind of go into a training thing. It's like if I was a ball player, I would have to stick with the program till you know until I hit the off season or something. And so I always kind of look at it like that. I get, uh, I eat healthy and uh, try to get enough rest. And, uh, you know, thank goodness I've always had a, a pretty, a pretty good, uh, strong constitution. And I've always could uh, count on my, count on my throat being there when I needed it. You know? So all of these dates that you have booked in through, through the end of uh, 2021 and, and even pre COVID um, when you were touring, 70 dates a year over the last 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, how much of a hustle is it for you and your, your people to make that happen? Is it, is it effortless because of your name and, and all of these hits or is it still uh, a hustle for you? It's a, yeah, it kind of is. I'm not involved in the hustle. That, that, that'd be, that'd be the last thing I would want to have to be in. I mean, I have to. I ha I want to do this kind of thing because okay, I saw BJ talking to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Brian the other day, and maybe he'd he'd be good to have a what. So I, I keep kind of keep up my end, and it's still it still is a hustle now because you know you want to keep your money up, and the longer you go on there, there are lots of people now who book and uh, for casinos and uh, 
who are with agencies and everything that who never heard of me. And, um, you know, they have, you know, they're not always Googling, you know, these older entertainers, you get older. And, you know, that's the one thing about music. It's always, music is always about, uh, you know, who, who the next guy is, who, who's the next young guy or whatever. And so you have to recognize uh, at some point that there is an evolution to this thing. I mean, even you know, with Sinatra or whatever, uh, right. we all have to face that, face that time when there'll be a time when maybe I, I can't sing and, uh, and maybe, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not as popular and that kind of thing. So I've had to deal with that over uh, a period, a period of years and just, uh, you know, you try to just keep your price up so it, it, you can, you, you know, I, I don't know if I'd do it for nothing or not. I mean, there was a time when I would, but now I'm not, I'm not sure now. I mean, I'm at the kind of at toward the end of what could possibly, uh, you know, I mean, how much longer can I, can I go? I mean, I'm, I, I'm dedicated to get it, to go until I'm 80, but, uh, and Tony Bennett is the, the, the shining, excuse me. The shining example of someone who aged so beautifully, and uh, and still could do it at a certain level. So if I can still do it at a certain quality uh, that I can res- that I can respect, then I'll then I'll keep going. But uh, uh, eighty looks like uh, it looks. Like, and I always was wondering how how would I would I retire or what would the ending look like? And now it looks like uh, that's going to be kind of dictated to me that I may not even get to work. Uh, before I'm 80, we don't know exactly how this thing is going to go. So I'm, I'm very dedicated to not getting ill. Uh, you know, I don't want to get sick because I think that would spell the, the end of it. And I always have had a burning desire to, to do it. I'm sure you have a burning desire to do what you do. And so, uh, I'm, I'm really the most peaceful when I get to do what I want to do. So I'm, I'm having to deal with that now, not, uh, not really. Uh, having a, it's not even an opportunity. It's just you, you, you couldn't do it if you did have an opportunity. So it's a, it's a diff- difficult time that I, that I don't think any of us ever thought thought about going through. You know, it, it's interesting this concept of um, staying relevant and uh, as an entertainer and um, and a star. And um, I know that some people struggle more than others to to stay relevant. But one one sign I think of your staying power over the years. Um, are the stars and and singers and performers that still want to collaborate with you that want to do benefits with you and i i noticed that kebmo video yeah uh, where that was... uh, i mean what that was an, an incredible video because it shows that you are having fun with someone who is younger than you and a completely different generation and a different genre of music, Kebmo, uh, singing, yeah. singing this classic of yours, most of all, and you're having so much fun together. Um, it's just, a, it's a great video, but then you, you have this, uh, benefit concert that you did for COVID relief with, um, Lisa Loeb and George Thorogood and, mm-hmm. uh, Don Felder. And, and I think that's just a testament to what you have created, kind of the legacy that you've created in music. Well, I, w- I was uh, very pleased that they included me in that uh, that uh, uh, music for the COVID relief and uh, for people who are struggling to feed their families and stuff. So I was really proud to be a part of that. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I kind of am from our generation or my, my generation it, it, uh, it was a generation that wasn't competitive. We were we we were all but buddies and. And, uh, you know, and so I don't know, is it more competitive now? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was a kind of natural for us to want to sing together and, and do that. And I didn't, I had, you know, 10 times, uh, more of opportunity to sing with someone than I, that I took advantage of. I tried to make sure I, I kind of did, uh, did something that was going to work, work for me. Uh, but you know, gosh, I worked with the, uh, you know, Barbara Mandrill, Ray Charles, and, and, uh, it, it was so much fun. And I think back, especially back from that, you know, that top 40, uh, period, uh, people loved to work together. And it was, um, it was a great way to get together because uh, we used to all go out and tour together, be 10 or 12 acts uh, on the road together. And then that kind of people got much more, uh, concerned with their own sound. 
and uh, they didn't want to use the sound you, you you used. They wanted to bring their own sound in. So, you know, after one act got through, well, then they break down your stuff. And they'd come and set their stuff up, and that's how they kind of turned into an all-day festival kind of thing instead of, you know, 15 acts in one one night, you know, one performance. And uh, so it kind of, it, of course, music is always always changing. And uh, so it got to where we don't get together as much. So it was really great to get get, get with Keb, who has this world of respect out there and who worked uh, closely with uh, President Obama and, and uh, you know, Richard Marks. And the new, my friend that I, I've known since she was four years old, Sarah Nimitz, I uh, sang Hooked on the Feeling with me. Of course, Vince. Vince came in and sang and, uh, you know, Lyle loved it and all those. So that was a, really a fun thing to do. What mistakes do you, when you look back on your career, what mistakes did you make in business in terms of contracts and royalties and things like that? Man, all of them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Made all the mistakes. Uh, I never was really worried about uh you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't care anything about doing business. You know, I look at Mick Jagger. I mean, he does all his business. Total respect for a guy that can do that. And Kenny Rogers, extremely intelligent. And uh, he, you know, he was involved in his business. But, you know, that was the last thing uh, you're going to do when, when you were going through some of the things I was going through. So we made all the mistakes. Uh, and we were kind of from a generation in uh, music when when it was industry practice not to pay somebody. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. guys like Little Richard who never never got one penny in in royalties. You know, oh, that's so crazy. Uh, so you know, it was kind of during a time when it, boy, you needed to take care of business and uh, and um, you know, I, we had some good periods where we did where we did get get the money we we had coming and we did make the right decisions. You know, thank goodness. Uh, so it wasn't, and you know, I'm not saying it was a total disaster, but many, many business mistakes, uh, you know, that'd be the, if I, if I ever had the desire or the, 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 the possibility of going back and redoing it, that would be the one thing uh, I would pay attention to because now uh, at, at my age, it, it's re- it's really become important. Yeah, you know, if I had just taken care of a little business then, you know, it be, might be a little better right now. So. Yeah. For instance, uh, raindrops. You know the raindrops song. Um, is that a song that continues to pay royalties to you? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, a, a number of years back, I don't know how many years. Maybe it's been eight, ten years or so. They started paying on the vocal performances. Nice. Uh, and and so uh, that that has been something we get paid on. Of course, you know, you know, thank God for our union and uh, after and the musicians union and all that. So you, you kind of, you know, and, and there are people that dedicated themselves to making sure that uh, we all get what's coming to us. So that's been, uh, that's been good. But yeah, they started paying on vocals and uh, that was great. I mean, I was with a great label, Scepter, Scepter Records. Oh uh, yeah. Le- legendary. But they, they were really not good with money. Uh, they, I guess the best album I made with them was a, an album called Billy Joe Thomas had rock and roll lullaby on it. And it had a song called, um, uh, happier than the morning sun, which was the first song that Stevie wonder had written that another guy myself did before he, he did it. So I had that one coming out and I had a song by Paul Williams and it was going to be my, 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 you know, what, you know, of course most plans in the music business don't go like, like you think, but then the, uh, they had, they had uh, you know, Dion Warwick, and they had me. I was selling records, and Dion. Warwick, and then next thing you knew, they couldn't, they couldn't even press records because they had, they just did weren't good at business, and they made some loans from people that you can't pay back, and and certain certain uh, business mistakes. So, uh, you know, you just uh, you never know. I'm, I'm not one. Of, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of guy that ever needed a bunch of money, and. Uh, and so I, you know, I, uh, I've I've always been fine. I've always had all I, all I needed, and uh, uh, you know, it's all worked out okay. What What do you think are the pros and the cons of the way the music business has changed in terms of veering away from hard copy albums and CDs towards streaming? 
Well, I think that's all good. I think they've worked it out now where they do get paid. I mean, I think there was a period of time when that first started when people were downloading and not paying their, you know, musicians only make money by the pennies. And and that, that those pennies add up very slowly. And when you have people who stop paying the pennies, then, then that, it really hurts over the long run. But but I think that's all good. You know, a, a, you know, a guy can a guy like a, you know Bieber can go in the, in his bedroom or living room and make a a worldwide uh, smash. I mean, <laughs> I, I think the technology has has really changed where and enabled people to uh, do more than they could ever dream of. They don't have to have a contract. They don't have to be in a big studio. They can do it right here in the living room. So. I think that that's that's changed. I think the the exposure you, you can get. It, there always was a thing back uh, years back where a good song would find its way. You know, now I'm not so sure about that because th- there are different ways that they program radio, and uh, uh, there's no you know there are not many stations who are going to play your songs for a couple of weeks and give you a break. You know, I'll give you a shot. It doesn't go like that anymore. So I mean I think there's some great changes to the business and then there are some some that aren't aren't so great but you know it's always been a good and bad kind of thing so yeah you have to take it like it is yeah yeah I, I'm with you I, I I think that it's there are some a lot of positives with the streaming situation but I really miss the experience of buying an album and having this catalog of music all contained. And there's a theme to it. There's there's a visual aspect it, uh, to it. There's there's a tactile experience where you're, yeah. you're feeling the gloss yeah. of the the. Album. Yeah, I kind of miss your. Uh, I kind of forgot your question. Yeah, I think it's a r- huge world of difference between a CD and an album. Right. I mean, man, I used to love it when my album would come out, and I would have this great picture, and I went to Central Park and shot the pictures or, or whatever. Uh, so that yeah, I think there's a a real a real change there, and and you know you can go back and some of your favorites. I can I can go back. I won't say you because you're you're a young guy, but I can go back and all my favorite records. I I can hear mistakes in them. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> they, they speed up. You know, somebody bumps into a chair with his knee or something, and they they all have that. Whereas now uh, there's really uh, people mostly strive for p- perfection, perfection with a meter. And and the vocal, I mean, you go you go do a vocal now. You have a vocal. Back when I cut in Memphis, when I did Hooked on a Feeling, we got the song. As soon as we got the tape, where everything was good with the band, then the band took the went smoked the cigarette or whatever, and I sang the song. Uh, and and basically the performance was already done, but there was a spot or two. And anyway, I sang the song a couple of times, and we moved on. We were done. Uh, whereas now, you know, you you kind of Cut a track, and um, and and they said, "Well, Thursday at two o'clock, we're going to do vocals." Uh, well, <laughs> well, uh, well, okay. And you know, I know, it's been so difficult for me to make that work because vo- vocally, I'm always so much better when the band is we're we're, we're doing the song, and and, uh, um, and and now a lot of times the 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 song gets done, and it's huge. It's a huge success. I'm not knocking that. Uh, or saying it won't be successful, but maybe the band never really even got together once. You know, mm-hmm. it was built the drum track first, and then the, then they put the the keyboard, and then and it got built up, and then you know, um, Thursday you're going to do you know one o'clock you're going to do your your vocal. So it's a, it. I used to uh, I, that was a part of the of the business that I always loved the most was the recording and doing a new song, getting in there with a the band and making that thing work. And uh, and then that became after a number of years that became the most unpleasant part of the whole the whole thing because it just became so tedious and and where's the soul and singing the thing for the tenth time and and punching in this note and that note so it got it got for a guy that came from where you know I came from it got it, it got to where it wasn't as much fun. You know? mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I, you know, my. I, and then I, I had to have it on this little CD, and I didn't get to have my big. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, so different. And listening to your your catalog of music over the last uh, week or so, getting ready for this interview, I, I did notice that you know the studio recorded songs that you did were 
were huge events. I mean, you're talking, you know, I think that I think on raindrops, it was like a hundred musicians, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, for the, you know, for the bicycle scene, it was only three guys, me and me and three guys. It was kind of a different thing in, in the movie, but yeah, when we recut it for the single version, that was the number one record. I mean, there was like a 90 guys in there, you know, and Bacharach was, I'm, I'm singing here and Bacharach is standing on this riser and he's directing. And I mean, it's uh it was an awesome experience, you know, and yeah. we only did it when we recorded uh, Raindrops and not to make it too big a deal. I mean, hey, it's just another song, but to, and and the, many years ago. But, you know, when we cut the song, we only did it three times. Uh, we did it three times and uh, e each take had some imperfections and uh, and, you know, they figured it out. They spliced this take. Maybe they I think they put all three of the takes together. Uh, splicing wise but uh you know it wasn't something that we were going to run through 15 20 times and uh, then then come back on another day and do the vocal we were doing it and i i think that's a, uh mostly the way uh mr bennett does it tony bennett does it mm -hmm. he sings live with a huge or orchestra and there is a difference that you feel right you you, you can feel it you know yeah it's i think there's a certain vulnerability to it when you hear the little uh, little imperfections that maybe not consciously you're perceiving, but it gives it some authenticity that the newer music today, which is, as you say, they're striving for perfection and the computers allow it to be perfect so easily just with yeah. an edit. Um, but there, I think you, you lose something when you have that perfection. Yeah. And there was a guy, there was a guy in Memphis when I first started recording there who, who, who passed, who passed with a guy named Tommy Cogbill. And uh, one night somebody mentioned, well, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of sp uh, speeded up in the last verse. And he said, well, if it's not faster in the last verse than it was in the first verse, you're not doing it right. You know, <laughs> so this, and, and raindrops was the same way. It started out raindrops and it kind of started out kind of like that. But then the last verse, it was raindrops. It was up, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that just feels that just there's just a certain feeling to that kind of thing when it's not, uh, uh, you know, perfection works too. I'm not saying it doesn't, but uh, the feeling was the, was the thing we were looking for. Yeah. You know? Well, BJ, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and hearing about your career. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, you start performing again, hopefully soon, and those dates hold. Um, you're, I, I notice on social media, you, you have, uh, you're quite active on social media. You have the, the BJ Thomas at Instagram and Twitter. Um, and you the, do uh, the, the, my Instagram is something I do personally. And then, um, uh, and my Twitter, Twitter also, but we do a lot of PR now on, on the Twitter, which I think is the BJ Thomas also. Yeah, and we got a good Facebook thing, and we we with a, gr a great company that does it quite well. So, and your website is bjthomas.com, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great website, by the way. So if you're oh, if thank you're you wanting to go um, check out BJ's career, it just covers a lot of the uh, a lot of the key points in his career and some some nice video content in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, check. Check BJ Thomas out on social media, and when he's performing, check him out in your area. So, um, Mr. Thomas or BJ, thank you so much for your <laughs> for your time today, man, Brian. I, I appreciate uh, you uh, supporting me, and uh, I, this was a great. Uh, I enjoyed this conversation, and thank you, thank you very much. And hopefully, I'll I'll see you sometime down the road. Yeah, that sounds good. I I need to visit Texas. Where in Texas are you? I'm in Arlington, Texas. Arlington, okay. Are you yeah. are your neighbors with uh, with Willie, <laughs> or is he no, in a different part of the state? No, I have to go down state? to Austin to see Willie, but yeah. uh, he, he's a few hours away. But uh, his, his secret to longevity is a little different than yours, I think. <laughs> and Tony Bennett. Yeah, you know, I think Willie just takes it as it is, and uh, you know, he's he's another great example of uh, of someone who is just uh, you know held on to who they were. And he's just who he is, and he's, uh, you know, totally respected by all of us out here. And, uh, you know, we, we we really appreciate how he's done it and the, the example he set. He's, and he's got a long way to go. Yeah, good for yeah. him. Yeah, well, great talking to you, BJ. Thank you, buddy. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. 
Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.